right, uh, let's call a uh, meeting of the Union 38 uh, School Committee to order. It looks like about 5.03 p.m. Uh, and let's just, uh, just a couple ground rules because it looks like we have a fairly large meeting. Um, and I think the techies tell us it's going to be more successful if everybody who is not on the school committee, a school committee, uh, would maybe shut their video off. Uh, that doesn't mean we're trying to get rid of you. Uh, and it doesn't mean that you, if you speak later that we don't, you know, that you don't come back on video, but it's just going to probably help make it more efficient for everybody to hear and, and see uh, what's going on. Uh, I think so. Um, yeah, well, everybody's going to be muted too, unless uh, we speak. Uh, Phil, just mentioned to you, not picking on you, but Earlier, we were picking up some nice breezes there on the vineyard, so you may want to keep yourself muted until you talk. <clears throat> all right. Uh, and all right. And then, uh, in terms of our agenda, uh, Phil, can you hear? I guess we can. Okay. Uh, <laughs> In terms of our agenda, we're, we're, yeah. we're going to... Uh, yeah, I heard. Yeah, we don't want to hear those nice breezes on the vineyard. So can you mute yourself unless you're going to talk? Beautiful. Thanks. Um, it, <laughs> in terms of the agenda here, we're going to uh, obviously deal with the review and discussion of the uh, school reopening plans, uh, since that's sort of the main a part of the meeting, and because that's probably of interest to folks, we're going to move the public comment uh, to after, after we hear from the uh, superintendent about those preliminary plans. Um, so without further ado, I think Darius will turn it over to you to talk about those things. Sure, I, th I thought it would be good to give a general overview of what we're, what we're talking about, make sure everybody is on the same page, and then, um, you know, people I know there's going to be public that want to comment about the plan, but I think it's better to understand before you can start hearing comments about the plan that you understand what the what the planning is at this point. So um, I do have a, um, a little slideshow to share to kind of keep me focused here as I do that. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with everybody. Everybody see that all right? One of you say yes? Yes. Okay. All right, so here, here we have, so um, <clears throat> our plan that was set out from the state, and as I go through, this picture here is that we started a, at Frontier, <clears throat> the Jumpstart math program started this week, um, where we had 12 students come, and it was just an interesting picture. Um, so what we're gonna talk about is different models of possible return, and it was just something to kind of people wrap their heads around of what, we have, you know, we're doing kind of a trial run right now with this summer school program, um, you know, at the school. Um, and so and it was a nice picture. I asked for a picture of that because it was when we pulled up, it was nice to see kids' faces in some sort of uh, uh, learning environment that we haven't seen in a while. Also, before I want to get started, I, I really want to thank all the planning committee members, um, the CPAC, the staff, the family, and of course, school committee members um, for the for their work in creating this report, and also um, the feedback that we've received so far. You know, we've asked for feedback as part of the, the what I sent out to the community. Um, it's been very helpful to get our, you know, wrap our heads around, you know, we know the plan is not complete. Um, it's to get ideas flowing, especially in the exact what the plan rolls out. Um, but the, the feedback has been excellent. I also want to, you know, um, do a special thank you to Kim McCarthy and Sarah Mitchell. Um, Kim worked um, to the bone over the weekend on the elementary side of this and putting the parts together. Um, I think I set a timeline that wasn't realistic and um, she made it happen and Sarah as well made it happen. Um, but I just wanted to, I just want to say an extra thank you there because I know it was not easy getting this plan out in that, in that timeline. So let me just talk about the timeline of where we are in decision making because I know, especially if we have community members listening in, um, to have an understanding of what's going on here. You know, right now we you know we released the plan on July 13th and 14th. Um, I staggered it staff 
The committee members got it first for review to make sure we didn't make any major omissions and errors. We then sent it to the staff and then we sent it to the, the, um, the public the following day, meaning families. Um, I did a voluntary staff meeting with all the elementary schools yesterday. Um, so we did four separate meetings, each were over an hour in length where we had, had questions and talked about um, different things regarding the plans um, to get some initial feedback on that. Frontier's having their meeting on, on Thursday. Um, again, their the Frontier meeting is tomorrow night, so they had a little bit more time to put that together. Um, we currently have school community meetings right now where we're gonna be getting more feedback. There is a bunch of town hall meetings, I'm calling them, but you know, basically parent meetings or community meetings to talk about ideas about the plan, answer questions. Um, and I'm gonna show that in the next slide in a second so you can get an idea of that. Um, and one thing I'm going to be asking the school committee tonight is that originally I, I put forth a plan of looking at the, the plan this week and voting on it next week. Um, and I think that was too ambitious, a little, um, you know, and also as we try to put this plan together, it's far more complicated. And, and additionally, um, the, the commissioners asked us not to vote a plan until the first week of August. The uh, NCA is negotiating with DESE. Um, there's also a lot more guidance coming out from the state. We don't have guidance on regarding busing yet. We don't have guidance on what you're supposed to do if there is an outbreak in the school or a case or a case. They're gonna give us um, very clear guidance in that area, I'm told. Um, and so without all that, voting a plan moving forward, um, they may think there's gonna be too many parts missing. So I'm gonna ask the school committee tonight to, just, to consider having a meeting the first week of August for the final vote of a plan, and then also discuss whether or not they should have a meeting in the middle, but that's your business, and I'm only gonna be recommending that. Jesse right now made a final deadline of August 10th to have a plan in place um, and report that plan to Jesse. I have to submit this plan that we put together here by the end of July, showing that we thought of three different options moving forward, but let me get to that. Um, these are the town meetings. Um, parents, um, not the town hall meetings, rather, not town meetings. Um, we have, we did one on, on Friday at noon. Um, we didn't want to get those who were anxious to give some feedback. It's in the middle of the day. We understand that. That's a full union wide. And then we did one by building for each of the elementary schools, um, two each evening on Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, principals will be doing robocalls out if they haven't gone out already. I have a ton of emails I haven't checked this afternoon, so Barry went out. Thank you. Um, but inviting families and giving the links and we'll put it on all the normal places we post things. Um, Frontier is going to be on Tuesday of next week um, as well. So giving each kind of each individual community within our greater community a little more of an intimate setting outside of the big meet, the bigger meeting there um, to ask your questions and you know, share your ideas, concerns. Um, and, and again, I also encourage people to fill out the form that went out with the form. We are looking at that and um, um, as you'll see here, we even have some of this in our presentation tonight. Um, so initially, the first thing I want to talk about is that the, it, coming out of all the committee work, the one thing that we looked at, no matter what we chose for an in-person um, model, um, there was going to have to be some sort of gradual orientation. There's a lot of concern about the social emotional well-being of, of students. Um, who've been away for so long. We talk about, you know, being the elementary meeting. You talk about first graders who maybe only had a half year kindergarten. Um, it's going to be very difficult in the sense of the social emotional level to get the, the, the orientation to bring them back to school. And so we started laying out a plan of having half the school in at a time for half days um, over, the first, over the first couple of days. Remember, this plan is all a draft. We wanted to get ideas out there. Yeah, people go, oh, that's a good idea. Have you thought about this? Or it should be longer, it should be shorter. Those are all, we're accepting all ideas um, within this, but the idea is we wanna show you what we're, what we're thinking about. And in my overview today, I'm really just concentrating on the school models. I didn't go into all the protections. I mean, the, the, the report is 30, 34 pages long and very detailed. Um, I didn't go into each one of those things. So I certainly will answer questions and that kind of stuff throughout them from the committee and such. Um, I just want to tell you in my overview, I just kind of hit the major points. So um, we're looking at the importance of an orientation. Um, <clears throat> there are three models. The Department of Education is requiring that we submit three models. One is they want to know what it will take for all students who choose to attend 
um, to fit in our buildings. Can we, can we actually get all students back within the six foot model? Um, they're saying three foot model, we're trying, we're, we're pushing back and saying more of a six foot model, but within the three to six foot model, what does it take? And if you can't do it, what do you need in order to make it happen? And so I have to give a report again to the state by the end of July that, that, that does that in purpose, that in-person um, uh, plan. The next thing they also talked about is a hybrid model. And you look at where some students are in the building and some students are learning remotely. Um, and we, we started you know, flushing out some ideas of hybrid models. And I really wanna emphasize again, these are draft of models. We're just, we're throwing things against the wall and seeing what, seeing what sticks. But the idea around them is, are, are solid. You know what I mean? The ideas, you, you know, why are we doing it? You know, how are we doing it? And, you know, and there's a hundred different ways to do these hybrid models, but, you know, getting some initial ideas out there, and I'm going to talk about them in a minute, those hybrid models. And then last, um, the remote model, you know, you know, is there, are we going to, you know, I think even if we go back in person to some level, we have to be ready for remote. There's talk about resurgence of the virus and such. And then there's also obviously some concern in the community about going back to school at all. And so a remote model that looks different than what we did in the spring, meaning improving it. Um, you know, we had to do that in mid stride. Um, we had a change on the fly and families and, and students had a change on the fly and obviously teachers had change on the fly. You know, so what, what can we do to improve our remote model um, and, and, and what can that look like? Um, that has to be one of the models. Um, those are the three models. Um, the key point for, for being in person, we do have the space to accommodate all students at the elementary level. Um, however, they're gonna have to be divided into smaller groups. Um, I think we can fit around 16 or so per classroom. It varies on school building and such. Um, some of those classes in some of our smaller schools or you know, smaller classes in the bigger schools fit, can fit. Um, some of our other classes are over that and so they would have to be divided. So that's one of the key um, to accommodate all. So when we say we, they can all fit in the building, they don't fit in the normal capacity that we have talked about in, that, in, the, in, the, in, the, in past models. Um, the hybrid key point, um, you know, again, in, in the both the back to school and the hybrid model, families will have a choice for remote learning. Um, the state has said that we we will we need to provide still a um, at home um, learning model. There's a lot of different models out there. A lot of school, different districts across the state are looking at different things to do that. We're still very um, we're open to what that's going to look like. Um, because it may, it depends on what model we choose and what the home model looks like. Because if you have a hybrid model where we have half the students to come in person, maybe two days a week, and then three days of remote learning, we would still be able to stay together in, in some capacity. Um, the other hybrid model is half the students meet on one, on, um, on one day, and um, half the students meet every other day in a rotation. Those are the hybrid models. The key points there um, for remote, you know, we, we purchased Schoology, which is a new system to help manage, um, you know, classrooms and files and that kind of stuff. It's a, it's, it's a daunting task, and you're going to hear, you may hear from teachers that it's, it's a lot to pick up. But we really didn't have the ability to, uh, we didn't have a, a resource to provide the teachers earlier that allowed the organization that it does. Um, it's similar to Google Classroom. Google Classroom can be loaded into it. The files can and such. But it's a lot more, it has a lot more organizational structures if we're, if we're, if we're having to go to a remote model. Um, there's more parent view communications teach, features as it says there, you can do small group learnings. It's got a better um, chat feature. It's a lot more like Zoom than Google Meet. Um, and it's affordable and it, and it fits right into our PowerSchool um, program. So all the attendance and grading and such can load directly, um, can load directly in there in contact and all that can load directly without problems. So those are there. Let me just take a deep breath here because I'm talking a lot. Um, so I don't know, David, how you want to do this. Do you want me, I got a couple more pages of just kind of some overview stuff, and then we'll go to questions and then uh, open. Oh, since they open mic, then public comment. How do you want do you, you know, because I imagine there's a thousand questions regarding what I'm talking about. And so, sure. Yeah. I mean, do you want to, are you close to wrapping? Yeah, you know, I've got about three slides left. Yeah. You know, kind of just give you the overview of what we're doing. So okay. we, we still want feedback and we're getting it and we're appreciating it. 
And this is really is one of those things, it is not one of those things that I have to emphasize it, and I know I've said it four times already. It's not one of those things where we have a plan, give us your feedback and uh, we're gonna move forward with our plan. We really are modifying this plan as we move forward, okay? So, you know, we're gonna, be, and we're gonna be sending surveys out to families shortly about how they feel about these plans, um, how, what kind of comfort level they have about sending their children back in these plans, because we have to have an idea about if, if families are choosing a remote, you know, what numbers are we dealing with there and how we're going to meet those needs. Um, if we decide to go, a, a mixed schedule um, and bring you know bring some kids back to the bringing back to the building, um, and we also have to, we have to survey the staff as well. Um, I, I did hold off on some of the surveys there. We did some initial um, inquiries, but you know I felt it was difficult to ask people to make give us their input when we didn't have any kind of plan in front of them. And so you know we're gonna be able to ask more you know precise questions. But given this plan, how do you feel that kind of stuff? Um, there's that feedback form as I already talked. The town hall meetings. As I said, the, e the links will be mailed out. We are also creating a special education strategic planning committee. Um, Karen Cranio is leading that off. We are also getting a consultant to help us out there, Sharon Jones, um, to help us um, really adapt whatever our model is, because um, there's going to be some sort of remote involved, at least in the you know I'm thinking in the beginning here, um, eat all special needs um, and vulnerable populations. So, and you know, you know, we're putting that together as well. And I think we really do need to look at some of our, our special ed, um, you know, how we're, how we're working with families and such, um, how we work with them, you know, this spring. And, you know, remote learning does, does not work ideally with that population. And so, um, you know, we need to look at that more closely. Um, and then school committee meetings, okay? And so, you know, you guys will talk about later about how you're going to be addressing that. Um, some feedback themes that we've gotten already, okay, and, then, and we may hear some stuff about this evening, this evening from staff is, you know, you know, the staff wants to know what about high risk staff members, what about staff members that really are, have levels of uncomfort about coming back or have high risk family members, you know, what can we do about them, um, what, you know, what can, what can the, the plans do about them. Um, screening procedures and health and safety trainings was brought up, training and professional development, Air quality in each of our buildings, child care options. Now, that's kind of for something like child care options. Well, if you have, to have staff teaching and their students are, you know, on an everyday model and they're their children and they're and we don't have, you know, um, child care, you know, how can how can we help in that area? We also have child care options. We have issues with staff with children in other districts. And every district is not on the same, you know, they're as you are reading the paper and such, everybody's kind of coming out with their own a way to, to do this and um, you know different kind of hybrid models that may not match up and so that's going to cause difficulties for our staff as well there was concern about what about substitutes <clears throat> and if we're asking staff to stay home um, even if you know if you're feeling slightly ill in the past you may be a tile it's a new term tile nulled up and, and you went to work well we're not going to be asking people to do that and so there's gonna be concern about use of sick days um, you know, what if there too many, or, you know, there's too many of them, you know, being used, that kind of stuff. And so those are things that we have to work out. And then expectations for teacher, for the teachers, um, you know, are they gonna be doing both remote and in person? How do they do both? And are we asking them to do both at the same time? You know, because you know, some of these plans and you're also hearing plans from other districts where sometimes they're asking teachers to do that. So um, <laughs> the time and guidance to support, um, you know, to, to do all this. Um, what we've heard from families so far, um, options for remote learning for all families, um, hybrid and remote models is challenging for working parents. Um, you know, and I think that is, you know, to comment further on that, a lot of our plans, especially with the orientation model, doesn't have the school as a place where students can be all day um, in a daycare model, after school as well, excuse me. And that's gonna be a challenge um, for our parents. And so we're gonna to have to either, is there a way we can help them or ways that you know, we do phases so that we can possibly get to meet those needs. So you know, we'll talk more about that. There's a lot of views on face masks from not wanting their children to have to wear them to I'm not sending them, my child to school up here and wearing them, to you know, across the state kind of, uh, it seems like a small thing <laughs> over a face as we're seeing even within our own, within the public. Um, you know, shops and stuff. I mean, we're gonna see the same kind of issues with schools. So we've got that very clear guidance on, on what that is. 
Um, you know, parents are concerned that we're going to be proper health and safety training, obviously, and that we're keeping things sanitary. Special education support and services is a huge one. I talked a little bit about how we're addressing that, but it's still a concern. Um, trainings and resources for technology. If we do have to go to remote, you know, parents want to know a little bit more about it and how can, you know, we help them there. Um, orientation schedules, you know, that sort of things. More information about outdoor learning. In, in all of our sessions, we talk to teachers like, get the kids outdoors, get the kids outdoors, get the kids outdoors. We really want to see like, if the class can be broken up and be done in small groups outside or part of the group. You talk about some of these elementary buildings. Um, so many of the buildings have doors that lead straight to the outside or very close to being outside. Well, we can do a lot of small group stuff outside where masks can come off and there's, you know, we can add mask breaks that are already going to be planted in within the day. So um, that's important as well. Um, clarification on homework guidelines. We talked a little bit about homework there. Um, really an emphasis on social emotional getting students back. The amount of time that kids have been away from school. I mean, there's really a lot of work we have to do in the first few weeks of just getting students and staff comfortable um, in any of these models and, and really checking in on how students are doing um, and, so, and so on and so forth. Oh, I can hide that. I apologize. Um, and I put that up. Oh, the cohorts we group, be grouped. When I use the word cohort, basically what the state is saying that they don't want students mixing throughout the day. They want students to be staying in the same groups, which, which is pretty... It's a lot easier at the elementary level. Those of you who are in the Frontier Committee, you're going to hear a different thing from Sarah um, and myself tomorrow. Um, but you know, in elementary, you know, grade levels are already a cohort, but you can't go mixing in specials and that kind of stuff. And so a lot of, you know, talk about how will we group them? And if we have to create smaller groups with them, how will we deal with that? And then um, and, and on top of all that, providing and maintaining rigorous um, learning experiences, because obviously, um, once we get people comfortable and stuff, we have to get back to the work of, of, of education as well. Um, one last thing before I kind of hand it back to you, uh, David, is that we are going to be making a reach out for the community. If we do go back to the buildings in any, in any form or model, we really are going to ask, what can the community do to support us? When I talk about the community, I mean you parents who are listening and who you know parents that are listening. We want to create outside areas that are comfortable. You know, can we borrow picnic tables, maybe pop-up tents that are on the larger size? You know, it will be the fall. Maybe you're done with them for the summer. We'll borrow them, give them back. We promise to take somewhat good care of them. We don't want your junk. Um, we got to throw that in there. <laughs> and we don't want things to repair, then put out. Um, we also are asking that, you know, there's going to be a lot of school supply use where there's going to be less sharing. You know, interesting, we, we teach our kids to share. You know, to change the curriculum slightly on that. So we're going to need extra sets of everything. And so while, you know, a lot of that comes out of school budget, I'm also going to be asking parents when you do supply shopping, you buy another set for the classroom. You buy two sets from the classroom. We have different levels of means in our community and those who can help. Um, I ask you to ask us if you have abilities to help us as we, as, as once we pick up the avenue going down, um, you can say donate bag chairs or clipboards. And already I'm hearing, I've had some people offer to make masks and donate to them to school. You know, the, a mask is soiled and a student have a cool, cool design mask. And I know there's a group out there that's, that's hard at work on that, so but I won't. Um, so uh, moving forward, you know, there's a timeline of a few weeks here where we have to kind of narrow our focus and kind of uh, put, a plan, put a plan forward. Once a plan is put forward, it's going to be then handed off to a building-based team that's going to figure out all the really fine details of each building. Opening up Deerfield is a lot different than opening up Waitley. You know what I mean? The, the, what the needs are, how students enter the buildings, the number of students, you know, all those kind of things. So we got to kind of take a general plan and then it's got to go down to a building-based level as well. So lots of talk, um, but I will go back here and start to unshare my screen, stop presenting here. I know it's a lot, the, the plan's a lot, but we got to start somewhere. All right, Darius, thanks uh, very much. That's obviously, um, you guys have done a ton of work, and it's um, obviously a pretty daunting task to, to put all that stuff together. Um, so look, we're going to sort of go to a public uh, comment period. I, I guess the strategy would be um, for people who want to make a public comment, perhaps uh, go into the uh, chat on the upper right-hand side. 
and just say that you would like to be recognized uh, and then we will recognize you um, for public comment. Um, and you know what, David, if, I they guess, could, if they could write their name in so that we have it for the minutes. So if they write their name, sure. the, they write their name in the comment, then we can call them by name and yeah, um, sure. Sorry, and then have it for the yeah. record. Yeah, identify yourself in the comments and say you'd like to make a comment and we will um, call on you. Or obviously, if you just want to make a comment or ask a question without it being done in person, you could just leave that uh, in, in the comments. Um, so as we wait for people to do that, I guess I just make a couple of comments. I noticed today in the New York Times, there was a new um, National Academy of Sciences came out and said that basically online learning was fairly ineffective for elementary school kids. And they recommended that wherever possible, uh, younger children, especially elementary and those with special needs, should attend school in person. And I'm just sort of jumping off of what you said, Dare, is about obviously some focus on uh, special ed uh, here is, is important. And I guess just to sort of put a positive spin on all this daunting stuff, it, it seems like we should recognize that we, um, you know, we've had some good governance in Massachusetts. Uh, we have people who are not making a political issue of this. Um, we are not Florida, we are not Arizona. We probably live in one of the safest, in the safest county in one of the safest states. Um, I think last week of those statistics through July 8th showed that there were no new cases uh, in our four towns. Um, the latest weekly stuff will come out today and who knows whether it's still the same, but I guess if there's anybody who can, uh, bring kids back to school and, and do it uh, right and safe, it's probably people in Franklin County and Berkshire County and a good part of Hampshire County. Um, so anyway, just on a positive note, I would hope that we would, you know, pay attention obviously to the good, the, you know, the facts and the science that's going on in our area to help people make themselves feel more comfortable um, if, we, if we go that route. Anyway, so let's see. Um, and if I'm misreading comment sections or top to down, tell me, but um, looks like going in order, there's a Holly Johnson who would like to make a comment. So whoever's, uh, Holly, if you could unmute yourself and talk or else whoever's controlling this, Darius or Donna could do that for her. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, my name is Holly Johnson. I have two girls at Waitley and um, another daughter at Frontier. Um, personally, I want to thank everybody for all your hard work. I made one pass through that um, document. I have not gotten a chance to submit my comments. I have plenty of questions and concerns, but I won't get into that there. I will submit my feedback. I'm really here to make a statement on behalf of the CPAC, the Special Education Parent Advisory Council. And we are asking that you consider the added complexity for special education students within all three models being proposed. Special education students were left behind with the remote learning and we cannot repeat those inequities in the fall. Students with IEPs and 504 plans are diverse and the best way to ensure their needs will be met is to include special education parents throughout the planning process. And we ask that CPAC representatives be a part of the special education strategic planning committee that you mentioned earlier. I know a lot of you have already mentioned um, special ed and I appreciate that. Um, we're just, as everyone is, we're very concerned and we would really um, want CPAC to be included in the planning process. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Holly. Um, and then it looks like we have a uh, Lisa Gaylor has a statement to read for Union 38. Um, Hi. Um, so I'm reading a statement on behalf of the union, uh, the union membership. To the members of the Union 38 Joint School Committee, in light of the current COVID-19 pandemic, the Union 38 Teachers Association surveyed our membership to determine how they felt about a physical return to school buildings, as well as some other key data points. We had a response rate of 77%, or 137 total members. Of those members, at least 34% fall into high risk for severe illness as defined by the CDC. That means about 47 members of our staff 
would be put at risk of contracting COVID-19 that could lead to, lead to hospitalization, prolonged life-altering symptoms, or even death. 36% live in a household where other members of the household fall into the high-risk category. So about 50 educators live with family members at risk of contracting COVID that could lead, lead to hospitalization, prolonged life-altering symptoms, or even death. When asked about models of returning, 75% of our membership reported they are either not comfortable or undecided with returning to teaching in person five days a week. Only 27% are comfortable returning to work in a hybrid model. Lack and expense of personal protection equipment, the politicization of wearing masks, the challenges of social distancing, in classrooms without well-functioning HVAC systems, combined with the infectious nature of this virus, make in-school instruction dangerous, putting students and staff at risk. Furthermore, a return to teaching in person would look nothing like it did last fall. Students will be asked to maintain distance from their friends, not to share, and to be masked throughout most of the day. How do we comfort a child from six feet away? How do we help them decode a word or work through a challenging math problem from six feet away or through a plexiglass divider? Despite our best accommodations, this will be a traumatic experience for many students, especially those attending school for the very first time. While we would love for the pandemic to be over and to be able to return to our classrooms in the fall, it is simply not in the best interest of our students or staff. In fact, our communities will be changing in the next month with an influx of children and adults returning from vacations or arriving at our local private schools and colleges. Some of them will be arriving from areas being ravaged by COVID. No one ever thought that we would find ourselves in this position and no one person created this situation. We are in this together. We want what's safe, what's just, and what is best for students and educators. With that said, the members of the Union 38 Teachers Associations strongly believe that there is only one safe way to educate students during the pandemic, and that is through a robust remote learning plan. The lives of the students, families, and educators in our community are too precious to gamble with. Physically reopening school buildings would create an emotionally and physically unhealthy setting for students and staff. It is a risk that can easily lead to the spread of COVID-19, and, and it is not a risk we are willing to take. We don't want to ask what's the worst that could happen if we bring students and staff back to the school buildings. Do you? Thank you. Thanks for that, uh, Lisa. Can you, um, Lisa, just make sure that statement is, um, I don't know, emailed to somebody, maybe Darius or Donna? Just think, okay, yeah. Yes, I'll send it to Darius if Love. he doesn't already have it. Okay, okay. Um, uh, what, uh, Wendy, who is on the phone, would like to speak, according to somebody? So, Wendy, are you there? I am here. Um, I just have a couple of questions. I'd like to thank everybody. It's a lot of work done in a short amount of time, and it's it's appreciated. I am, I have to be honest, I haven't read the whole thing thoroughly. My questions are more for in school, and just if the plan could include what happens if a teacher or student does get COVID-19, you know, what, what is the plan? I think on the CDC, it says, you know, two to five days, you close down. You know, how are the kids to be addressed? That's scary for them. Um, I think it's scary for the whole school if somebody gets very sick. Um, so I, I do think it's great for kids to go to school um, in some ways very healthy, but I do think in other ways, like somebody getting um, very sick is is scary and 
and needs to be addressed on, on how that would work. I would also ask on the next survey if, if maybe there's more of an option for comment on some of the questions. They just weren't quite cut and dry. If, you know, do you feel comfortable sending your kid to school in September? You know, I don't know. You know, um, a yes or no, it doesn't, doesn't quite cut it. So if we get just a, a, an option for comments, I, I think um, that would be great. And just off the, the top of my head, would all classes in elementary school be separated half and half? Or are there classes that they deem or that um, the whole class would show up for? And I think if I, I will read it more carefully and I will um, send any comments I have to Ben if I have any more. Okay. But thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you, Wendy. Um, Jennifer Smith, I think, is next, according to David Smith. Hi, yes, Jennifer Smith. Thank you for listening. I just wanted to start off by saying um, how much I really, really appreciate the district and Darius and Kim, um, Sarah, the team of administrators, putting this together and incorporating teachers' voices and the community voices uh, I just don't see that happening in any other district. So I really, really appreciate the time and thoughtfulness and inclusivity that's happening with this plan. And then my comment for the school committee, I guess, is to, um, you know, teachers, teachers want to be back with their kids, but we are scared, as the union statement said, and we are concerned. And I, I hope that the school committee thinks really deeply about the protections for teachers and students um, around providing materials to protect us, providing um, testing to make sure people coming into the building are safe. We're, we're becoming frontline workers, which was not a job that we signed up for initially. And so I just ask you to consider um, and put in place protections for the teachers who really do want to be with kids, but we, we want to be safe and protected. Thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there are some comments here that people may see. It just seems to be a comment about um, let's, you know, be the standard for the community in terms of all of those common sense precautions that we all know we should be doing in terms of uh, face masks and hand washing and social distancing. And so I guess that's, you know, as this plan goes forward, Darius, I would hope that there will always be that component of whatever happens, sort of a reminder from the schools, uh, you know, to families that they need to be really doing all that stuff at home. Um, so I think that's, that's the gist of that comment. And it'll be a good thing to do. I mean, my sense is we don't have the kind of public health people we should who are kind of beating down, beating the drums locally and telling us all that stuff over and over again. So maybe since we're going to be communicating with a lot of families, we can take that on as well. Um, looks like uh, Jeremy, and I don't want to butcher your last name, so I'm just going to call you Jeremy, uh, has a comment next. I have trouble with it myself. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm Jeremy Bernaccioni. I've taught for over 20 years, 17 of which have been in Conway teaching kindergarten. Uh, Nice. Usually at this point in the year, I'm online meeting with other educators, coming up with, you know, how can we jazz up our butterfly unit? Uh, what new Eric Carl book is out there? Uh, you know, what kind of sharing activities are we going to do in the fall? Um, I'm heartbroken uh, over the past few weeks, the topics that are coming up for other kindergarten teachers, and these are actual topics what's the best place to get scrubs for when I'm working with my kids? How do I convert my cellar or my garage so that I can quarantine because I have family that's susceptible at home? Where can I go to get a living will? There's a lawyer in Florida right now offering free living wills for teachers. 
and what kind of prep can be done for children and staff if they lose a classmate or a teacher to COVID-19. Um, these are all things that I like to think of as not touching us, but they are. Um, and I just want people to realize that we don't make this request lightly. We want the kids to be safe. We want staff to be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if I'm reading this correctly, I think that's people are making certain comments about things that have already been said, which sort of stand on their own, but I don't know that there's anybody else who um, is wanting to address the committees. So I'm gonna sort of going, going, gone. Not that we are rigid. Obviously, if somebody wants to pipe up later, we'll probably let you in. But uh, does everybody agree that I'm not seeing anything else? I think that's right. Okay. Um, okay, so just um, sort of housekeeping then, uh, Darius, before maybe some committee members may want to ask questions and comment on this, but um, uh, so it sounds like we, it's going to be these town meetings uh, for, for the community and stuff, and then um, likely a good idea for us all to get back together again, maybe in a couple of weeks. Is that what I heard from your initial presentation? Yeah, I mean, so let me be honest with our community. The um, statement by the union was, I was, I was made aware of it prior to our meeting today, but it was today. Um, so I thought, you know, I'm, I'm still digesting on how do we reapproach, um, how do we reapproach that? Um, you know, that we have different models where one is trying to do a safe return to school. Um, and there was a lot said in that in the statement that Lisa read, you know, kind of have to digest about what does that mean? Does that mean that we're still open to some sort of uh, bringing back or are we are going to be pitted in an adversarial relationship with employees trying to do what the community wants, you know? And so and I don't know what the community wants, you know? So this because we've kind of started this counter question, counter question um, within it. And I don't want, the last thing I want in our community is division created by this outside, but you know, it's, there's going to be, um, different opinions on, on pieces and that kind of thing. And so um, I think that, I think the committee, um, you know, it's clearly that it's not going to be a, uh, a simple, you know, here's a hybrid model, a compromise moving forward. It sounds like we're gonna have to have some several conversations and um, I think the committee is gonna have to, um, I'm gonna have to do some work away from here in the sense of talking with the union executive committee and other teachers and find out, you know, what is it, you know, what are we talking about? We're we just talking about remote because we can start, you know, I don't know if the state's going to allow it. And if they do allow it, um, you know, there's questions there because there is a lot of push from the state to get students back in the building. And, you know, I, under, I hear heart, the heartfelt things about safety, but there's another part of about what about student safety? And I'm, I'm just giving the other side because I, you know, I, I don't know where to land us myself. I don't want to be the guy that says, push everybody back into the building. I'm, I'm being honest. And, you know, someone gets hurt or dies, you know, I mean, and you can say it's very real. I also am very concerned about students who, who are at home um, for another half a semester, what's they, what's half a semester or maybe a full year, another year, year without adequate, you know, you know, learning or check in social emotionally that could lead to all the mental health issues that we have in our community and other types of deaths that are, you know, are occurring because of COVID. And so I, mean, I hear all the research on that. You know, I shared this with the staff yesterday, but 51 A's are down 50%. Do you think that students are home with families and, you know, there's 24 seven, there's less abuse and, and, that, and stuff that needed that need to be reported and where students need to be helped? You know, do you think that, you know, where are we with, you know, the overall with dropout rates and that kind of stuff? So I just very much, you know, I'm concerned about you know, how do you balance the two teacher safety and also not, you know, creating a generational effect of, you know, students over the long term and how can, is there a balance in there? You know, how do we get students back to school? You know, and when we commit to that, you know, are we remote for the whole year? Was that what we're talking about? Are we talking about, um, you know, a role in approach? I am I'm very much in, interested in a phase <laughs> approach. You know, I think that you know, as part of our planning in there is talking about a phase and approach. 
you know, looking at the first six weeks of schools and, and modifying with less students in the building. That was kind of where I think administratively we're leading with um, barring, you know, a, a, a jump up in, in, um, in cases and stuff. But again, I'm kind of a little lost right now on about how we go forward. We'll go forward. We'll, we'll figure it out um, within this meeting, that is. I mean, so I guess maybe we should ask questions about some of the current plans that are on the table. Um, and, you know, I also have Sarah, uh, I mean, I have Kim out there. And I think I saw Karen Ferrandino out there too. They can answer some special ed questions regarding some of our planning around that as well. They can help with those questions. So just so that you're well informed on this, because um, I'll be honest, teachers have a leg up because I had an hour meeting or an hour and 40 minute meeting in one particular case um, with them already to talk about some of these different concerns um, and kind of get a little bit back and forth. So maybe we go there, David. I don't know. It's up to you. Well, again, yeah. There, I mean, obviously, this is an initial sort of meeting, and uh, for you to present this to the to the school committee. So we're not—I don't think we're going to resolve anything today, and I don't think that was the intent. So no, it wasn't. People need to understand that. Um, and I think there was even a sort of specific directive. Uh, I think it was in the Globe yesterday from whoever the higher ups are at the uh, Department of Education in the state, saying, "Don't don't make any decisions. Get get your options out there because there's going to be more guidance coming uh, early August." So. People should just be, you know, cognizant of that. That we're not asking people to harden a position right now. We're asking for people to think about these issues. Um, and of course, feedback to help you with your refining of your of your three models. Um, so let me just go to. Uh, I see your hand, Trevor, but there's some other three members that have gone ahead of you in the in the uh, chat thing. It looks like so. I'm just going to recognize yeah. Elaine Campbell there. Yeah, I was just going to add on to what you were saying, David. I mean, I think we need to focus on the plans because that was what we were asked to do by um, the commissioner is to come up with three plans. And we don't, nobody knows yet. It, it may be the state may decide all this for us at some point. So um, I think we need to make our three plans as best we can and put our energy into that. Um, and, and then we'll see what evolves. I mean, we really don't know what's going to evolve and we don't know this control may be taken right away from us. And I think, you know, nobody wants hard feelings and getting in a battle about this or that right now. I'd rather put all our energy into a constructive project, which is make the three plans we have as solid as possible would be yeah. my hope. Yeah, um, because great. that's that's a constructive use of our energy. Yeah. Okay. Great point. Great uh, attempt to focus us. Thanks, uh, Keith McFarland. You're on that list next, I think. If you're out there. <clears throat> yeah, I apologize if my internet does not work. Um, so thank you for the uh, Darius for the hard work and the three plans. Um, it gives us a good. Uh, sense of direction, but there's two things I would like to uh, just to put out there. One, I think we need to think about, about some fluidity plans. Between the three. Um, Wendy spoke, if somebody gets sick, we might have to move. If we start with students in the building, we might have to move to remote model. And then if we want to bring students back, we might have to go to the hybrid model. So there's going to be a lot of fluidity, I think, between the plans. And then the second point, I think we have to think about the optics of voting to via Zoom. If, if we can't all meet in the same room, it would be really hard for me in good consciousness to vote to put kids and, and teachers back in the building. So we really have to think about that aspect. Um, okay, Keith, you kind of went in and out a little bit there, but um, were you saying the optics of, of voting on this? Can you just say it again? Sorry, there, you were in and out with your what's this Wi-Fi signal. Or, or is it me who if, grows? If we're voting, via zoom yeah i voting via zoom to have to put kids and teachers back if we can't i, I think it would be really okay. hard to, to back put teachers in okay okay got it sorry okay thanks um and i think these are just comments in here uh i'm gonna Trevor, i'll go back to you because and then i'll go back to those uh other committee members in the list there 
Oh, thank you. Um, so I, 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 I'm really um, grateful for all the work that the committees are doing, and, and I definitely hear the concerns of the teachers and, and the community and the parents. Um, you know, I think because I wear a couple different hats, one on the school committee and one on the Board of Health um, and Select Board, I, um, you know, I, I think we need to do uh, as good a job as we can to um, support the school system as a town and as a public health agency to try and make sure that, you know, those questions of what do we do when they're sick? Uh, what do we do when we have a case? You know, uh, Lisa White, our, our, our nurse from the FERCOG does an amazing job working with the school nurses. And we have, you know, all along this, um, this epidemic, we have been addressing you know, those issues, not in a school, but in a building or in a, in a business. Um, and so I think, I think what we could do is, is answer some of that and take some of those concerns away, at least understanding this is what happens when we have a, when we have a positive test. This is how we do the contact tracing. This is who does the contact tracing. And then, um, you know, we just want to support Darius, the administration as best we can um, from a town side and a public health side as far as getting those questions answered and making sure we have a robust um, testing, you know, ca capacity ready, ready to support the schools, because that's our biggest concern as well Is like, how do we, how do we support those schools and make sure that, you know, it's not just Frontier, it's not just elementary, it's Deerfield Academy, Eagle Brook, but man, all, all the schools coming back and we have larger, you know, we're going through a larger workshops through this with DA and, and, they, and they have, you know, kids from all over. So we're quarantining and all of that. So there's, there's a lot going on behind the scenes. And I just thank Darius enough for all the work and we will, we will work on a town side certainly to, to support as best we can. Go ahead, Darius. Thank you. David, can I just, just comment on, on, on two things. One is that the state said they are going to give us guidance on what does it mean if you have a case? What does it mean if you have a suspected case? and guidance on each one of those steps. I was told they were gonna give scenarios for each and guidance on how each should be treated. So we don't have that in the plan. So it feels like a big gap in the plan, but it's because we're missing that information. Yeah. Um, so they're gonna, they're gonna give, give us that output. I do have to, you know, I say that the, the line is that we have to meet like this. Um, that means we can't, you know, that, that applies to schooling. Well, I mean, I have administrative meetings with over 10 people. We're getting seating in chairs. We're sitting outside. We're sitting eight, six feet apart. We're having discussions. I just, I think it's kind of, that's, that's, it's a divisive kind of statement in the sense that we could all meet, but how do you get 108 people to be involved in an, in an open public meeting right now? You know what I mean? We're not talking about bringing students, of, you know, 30 kids into a single classroom or a single meeting hall. We're talking about doing things differently. So, you know, I think we could meet in person if we had to, but we would limit our, our public access. And it's the middle of summer. So I just want to put that out there because let's just be fair when we talk about, you know, how come we're meeting this way? And it doesn't really affect you know, how we go back in the fall. And I say that where, you know, I, I can be persuaded either way of what plans are gonna happen in the fall. I just wanna be people to be fair about one side versus the other. Well, uh, Merritt, if you're still there. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I'm still here, thank you. Um, so I was thinking about the special education CPAC comment. Um, I recently received some guidance from because I work as a special education teacher um, regarding the state's updated requirements for special education. Back in the spring, um, the accommodations were given to adapt the special education IEP programs that were developed individually for each student. And in the fall, to the best of my understanding, it looks like schools, teachers, districts, service providers, will all be required to meet what is written in the IEP, the Individualized Education Program for each student. So that's a big change. And um, I think it does reflect the CPAC concerns about that special education students do have unique learning requirements that are different than the general population students. And so, we may have to consider their requirements within those three plans that we're developing right now. Because um, I think the guidance from Desi that just came out uh, really requires us to take a, a really detailed look at how 
you know, in-person, hybrid, and remote learning affect students that are part of the special education programs. Yeah, Karen Ferrandino is here, and I, she could really respond to that. And I think there's probably a lot of people would want to hear about special education within these plans and her planning for next year, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. Sure, Karen. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and thank you uh, for bringing that up. Um, I think the first thing I want to talk about is uh, DESE, um, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, did put out a new guidance on July 10th. Um, and I, one of the things I was going to do this evening is share that with the CPAC. Um, and since that guidance came out on July 10th or July 9th, which was the exact same day that our administrative team met with the CPAC as well. Um, and the CPAC at that time um, had made a request to be more actively involved um, as we uh, proceed in determining how to meet the special education mandates in the fall. Uh, you're absolutely correct, Mike, what they, the, the guidance does say at this time, and everyone should know, is, you know, in the, in the past, the guidance was that we have two ways to meet the needs of support special education students, and that is through direct service and also resources. Resources were more like packets and information, but the new guidance is that we must meet 100% of the IEP methods, and that we must implement the IEPs as they are. Um, and provide those supports and services on the IEP. And uh, what we're doing as a district and in the process of doing, I sent the email out to the elementary school teachers yesterday, is we are pulling together a special education strategic planning committee that will involve both elementary, middle school, high school, special education teachers, some general education teachers, and parents from the CPAC. So I'll be reaching out to them. It doesn't dismiss the work that the administrative team and the other committees need to do to incorporate uh, special education and the ability to meet the needs of special education uh, students in our opening plan, but the, the committee will have an opportunity to really review the documentation from DESE to see where our opening plans are at that time and make recommendations. Uh, I will be reaching out to the CPAC to find three parents from the elementary, the middle school, and the high school uh, to join that committee. Um, and uh, we will be pulling that together. It will be run by Sharon Jones, who's an instructional leader with the Collaborative for Educational Services, so she can facilitate the various viewpoints um, and ideas from um, all, all different perspectives. And bring at the end of, it will continue through next year uh, to develop strategic planning for special education as um, we start to think about the fact that there will be in-person and always probably some remote aspect um, and use of technology as we move forward, forward in education. How do we start thinking about that as a continuum of services uh, as we move forward in the future? So I hope that answers your question. Two main things that came out in the guidance is yes, the implementation of IEPs um, and those services, whether they're done remotely or in person. And also the other priority in the, in the guidance that came out on the 9th was really looking at our high priority areas, which were early childhood um, and students with moderate to severe needs. And the guidance from DESE asks whatever model the district determines to you, whatever model we move forward with, that we take uh, moder our high priority students with moderate to severe needs, which is defined in the document, and early childhood and provide in-person services. So what the department was asking at that time is no matter what model you choose for kids with severe needs and significant needs, whether it's remote or in person or hybrid, it really demands a default of hybrid in special education. Because even parents who um, will have parents, even if we did return in person, that can choose to have their children stay home and we'd be mandated to implement the IEPs for those families. So I just, um, quick explanation. Uh, that we as a special education department, we as an administrative team are aware of this guidance and continue to talk about it. I met with all elementary school principals today and we were all brainstorming um, different ways in which we would be able to meet those mandates and what our priorities are. So thank you for bringing it up. Um, I will be reaching out to the CPAC to uh, bring parents onto that advisory committee that will uh, first meet on July 31st. I know that seems late, but again, that doesn't dismiss the work we're already doing as an administrative team and um, in the uh, reopening committees to discuss special education, it will be a continuum of that. 
uh, to bring various pers more perspectives into the fold. I hope that answers your questions. If not, feel free to ask me any specific questions and I'll be happy to answer them. Okay, thanks Karen very much. All right, any other, um, any comments, uh, school committee members who wanna say anything or pitch in or ask questions? All right. I'd like to speak. Oh, yeah. This is Jessica Corwin from Sunderland. Sure, go ahead. Hi. Um, just that I wish that we would work towards embedding in each of these three plans some uh, public health indicators where each one would be used. I know we're waiting on some guidelines from DESI that may be relevant and that the MTA is currently making negotiations at a statewide level um, that could that may include this, but we could start developing our own and use whichever set of, gu of guidelines for each plan is the safest. I think that's something worth discussing and would also probably help our teachers feel much more comfortable returning, knowing that they wouldn't be expected to teach in person if local infection rates were at a certain level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and I think, yeah, there have been a few questions about sort of those um, sort of public health indicators and how those can be incorporated into the plan. And frankly, one would hope that they would be doing it at the state level, um, treating different school districts uh, differently, depending on what's going on in those areas. Um, all right, thank you. Anybody Anybody else, if you, if you want to just pipe up, pipe up. I don't see anybody writing in the meetings and I don't see everybody's faces. I only got nine of you. Um, so, all right. Um, so, not, so not to harp on it again, but um, Darius, if, so if we're gonna move, um, if we're gonna move on to the rest of this meeting, do we want to talk now about a, a meeting in a couple of weeks, you know, after people have been able to, obviously those will be more refined in the plans and you will have had those town meetings with all of the schools and some members of this committee will have probably attended or listened to those meetings. Or do you wanna just do it by email and give us a, well, we'll just, well, let's expect that we're gonna have another meeting in a couple of weeks. Well, I'm, I'm looking at, I think people should have an idea of what, we, what we're thinking. You know, maybe, I'm thinking that we'd have a meeting on the last week of July you know, maybe Tuesday the 28th or the 29th, Wednesday the 29th, something like that, so that we can have more discussion about, you know, where things have, what we have put together at that point um, to kind of prepare what you know, the first week in August looks like. Um, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll refine those three modes, I guess. I, you know, I think, I, I think we have to kind of, uh, I, I mean, we, a lot of the feedback we got really um, will help us in that area. I mean, I still have my, the, the, the teacher statement is still fresh in my mind in the sense of how do we, we work that in. Um, so I guess more conversations with the teachers as well about, you know, if we have a phase approach. I mean, I, I really am a believer of the phase approach um, where we can, we can um, monitor how things are going, not just, not just COVID related, but how students are behaving and following rules and how, you know, education is working in these, in, in whatever model we put up and, can we handle more? Do we need to do less? You know, that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, that's kind of also why I added that whole orientation and as part of my original presentation is because it, it really the importance of, you can't just flip the light switch back on and have kids, things go back to normal. I'm not sure you can flip the switch back on if we could hand you all a special pill that magically made you immune. You know what I mean? There's a lot of, there's a lot of, a lot of work that has to happen with getting kids back in the building, especially our younger learners and more vulnerable learners. You know, it's been a, um, they've been outside of a classroom now for, we used to talk about the, the drop in two months of summer. I know we had remote learning, but it's just as we kind of, I don't believe it's the same. And especially it wasn't the same the way we delivered this spring. I think we can do a lot of improvements in that area. Um, I think all, all parties agree on that. So. Yeah. <clears throat> Darius, can I just tag on to what you said? Hey, McCarthy, folks. Hi, everyone. <laughs> it is so nice to see everyone and hear the comments and the varying viewpoints. And the admin team, Darius, myself, Sarah, every principal, all of us, so value your input. So any mechanism that you can get to us, your information, it's considered. It's there, it's important for us, and we need it. So please do not hesitate to provide that, that information to us. Valuable, completely valuable. Thank you. Great, thanks, Kim. 
Um, I noticed there is a comment. Somebody, uh, Samantha, uh, Fabian, are you wanting to say something out loud? Is is that a group of? Can someone help me? Is that a group of school nurses? Just Jessica, Meg, and I are working on a plan for staff to be able to give their ideas, opinions, etc., from a health perspective. Hi. Hello. Go ahead. No. Yes, Meg Birch and I are working on a plan for you know, staff to be able to input and we want to consider anything that anyone has to say and to support. We all want to work on this together. I know I'm new, but I want to be here and available to anyone who would like to reach out to me. So I've included my email. Anyone who would like to reach out to me, please, please feel free. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah, Donna, I've been trying to do that. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, do, do we want to title lockdown uh, at, at the Wednesday or the Thursday, the 29th, the 30th, tentatively for people's uh, calendars? Serious? You're the one who has the busiest calendar generally, and the rest of us fall into line. So, Well, this is the priority of my summer. Um, so um, <laughs> I can't say it without laughing. The, uh, what, so the is was Tuesday the twenty eighth. How people feel? I guess yes. I, we're doing it earlier in that week. Kind of puts it in the middle between that and um, then maybe that would be better for me, Darius. I know just for my two cents. But Wednesdays are tough. But um, okay. Tuesday be great if it if it works for everyone. Else. Tuesday the twenty eighth, five p.m. And then the next meeting would be Tuesday before the following week. To go ahead and pencil that in um, as well, where we, we, you know, we that way we can that way also the public has an idea of what, what our process is as well. Um, okay, and are we expecting some blockbuster news from the state that first week of August? That's so, well, they're supposed to give us all the guidance about what the bus rules look like, they're supposed to give us the guidance about you know, um, some of that, you know, um, public health indicators and such. and that's supposed to be part of that plan is also about what does it take to shut down a school? What should you do if you have students who may, you know, uh, who's being tested? You know, you don't even know. You know, you just give us guidance from there. And, and you remember that the DESE is working with a, it was is working with the on their board on this is the president of pediatrics in, in the United States. It's not a it's not a, a crew of misfits. It's a real um, hard folks. So that's why I'm kind of waiting on that instead of creating our own, which I understand, Jessica, but. I, don't, you know, I was told it was going to come out this week, so maybe if, like, by tomorrow. But as the state says, if it comes out this week, it really means next week. Um, so that part's been frustrating all along. Uh, so, but also the MTA, they're supposed to they're supposed to negotiate with them. You know, they're talking about you know, there's a lot of demands within the MTAs. I've seen their list of uh, demands through their negotiation processes with Desi, um, and you know some of them. I think there's you know there's, there's going to be some give on that that will affect us. Some I know there's a lot of talk about professional development and adding more days to the beginning of the year. I think that would be something that certainly all teachers would be interested in in any model. Um, being able to meet to you know flush out a lot of the issues that are there. Um, and by adding day by reducing the school year, the length of the school year they were talking about and adding days. So um, adding days for professional development. So. Right now, we can't do that without finding more money. So this would be a way in between. So, you know, the MTA came in with a, a, a much longer one, and maybe there'll be some compromise there. So I don't know what they're going to come back with, but it was enough where the commissioner said, "Don't pick something because there might be slight changes to your plan based on those negotiations." And so I think he's trying to be also in good faith with with the MTA that they, uh, you know, that they, uh, you know, we don't go 100% forward if they're still talking about possibly changing that. So um, okay. then I imagine the MTA is then going to ask its local people to negotiate further. So it is a, it's a, it's the way it works. Yeah. Okay. All right. So pencil your calendars in for 28th then. Um, and just a couple more comments before we sort of move on with our agenda, because they're likely on this topic. Uh, Sarah Chiaverini. Sorry if I didn't pronounce that right, but you can come online here and there you were very close. You were very close. It's <laughs> You were close. You were close. Um, I just, I had a few points that I wanted to make. Um, I'm a fourth grade teacher at Deerfield, 
And um, remote learning was definitely a challenge for me and my family. I have a four-year-old, so managing a toddler, like that's why it's taken me so long to make my public comment because you know being at home with the toddler, having a computer out is just impossible to kind of focus. Um, but I wanted to just kind of point out a few things about this virus, especially. Um, I feel like if we go back to school, it's too early. And I feel like some of the data that we're seeing isn't correct. Um, I lost my grandmother last week to COVID, but um, on her death certificate, they did not want to write that it was because of COVID. They wrote that it was congenitive heart failure. So there are people I feel like who are trying to make this seem like it's maybe not as bad as it is. Um, some of the data we see, I feel like may not even be accurate. And it's just the long-term effects of getting this virus is so detrimental on a human body, whether it's someone who's 30, whether it's someone who's 60, or whether it's a child. Um, someone a few days ago made a comment that if we go back to school, only about 2% of children will get it and will die from it. That's 15,000 children we are willing to risk to go back to school. Um, and that just doesn't feel right. If our job is to keep these kids safe and we're sending them into a situation where we know they could contract this highly contagious virus that is, is just so awful on the human body, it just doesn't feel like we're doing our job. Um, so I just wanted you guys to consider the really the long-term effects and keeping these kids safe. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And I thought I saw one uh, okay, uh, Meg Birch, were you just typing your name in, or did you want to say something? Um, I wanted to, to comment quickly, if that's okay. Um, no, that's you're, um, you're under the deadline there. <laughs> um, and I'm the Meg that uh, Sam Fabian, the new Sunderland nurse, referred to. Um, so for those who don't know me, I am the nurse manager, uh, nurse leader for the district for all five schools. I also am um, a building-based nurse at Conway. Um, and I just, I just want to, um, I want to say I do appreciate all of the comments and questions about the health-related. Um, the health related parts of of any kind of plan to return um and be in the building even part time um it it you know i'm i'm more than happy to take direct questions by email and try to answer them as best i can um so and i also want to just acknowledge and appreciate trevor's comments earlier about the role of the public public health local boards of health and the public health nurse, Lisa White, does um, provide services to two of our four towns. Mm -hmm. Working on, um, you know, communication channels and collaborative um, relationship with the other public health nurses that may be serving um, the remaining two towns. And um, I have a lot of the pieces that people are asking about in very rough draft form. I am working with Lisa White this summer. Um, and so I'm really familiar with the isolation and quarantine and, and the whole process that um, public health nurses and contact tracers are doing around the state. And I've been, I, they're not in the plan because we're waiting for the, for the state guidance because I didn't wanna put out something that was gonna be very different. I felt like that would be more confusing and more stressful. Um, so, I appreciate so, so much your comments, your concerns, your questions, um, and um, just know that I am thinking about most of these things. In fact, all of these things are, are on my list in some form, um, and I hear you. So that's just what I wanted to say. Thank you, Meg. Okay, thanks so much for that. Okay, we're going to move on on our agenda now, just because uh, 6.15, 6.20 or so. Um, but thanks, everybody, for comments, contributions, and together we're going to... David, I'm sorry. Can I speak, please? Sorry, who's that? My name's Jennifer Wheeler, and I've been at Conway Grammar School for 16 years. Okay. I've been a special educator in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, and then kindergarten, first, second, and third grade. 
And most recently, I've been teaching first grade for 11 years. When teachers say that they're not sure it's safe to return, I am the face of those teachers. I have asthma, and last year, in the span of four months, I had pneumonia and, I'm sorry, a respiratory event that lasted eight weeks and was not a diagnosed. I don't, the antibody tests are not reliable, so I cannot have one because it won't tell me if I've had COVID or not. If also works at Conway Grammar School. We moved from our home in Orange to be in Greenfield, so we would be 17 minutes away from our second home. Our concerns are baseless. None of us want to work remotely. Being with the children, being with our sweet students, that's what fuels our work, and that's what we're committed to. I know that this isn't a personal thing. I know that the decisions we're making, we're, we're all trying to do what's best for the children. We just may disagree on what that might be. But I ask you to please consider slowing down the reopening and get all of the options available so that it's safe for all of us. Going to return to the school that we knew. All of our classrooms had flexible seating, uh, print rich environments. Children were into were participating in cooperative learning all day long. That's not what they're going to return to. So I just ask that you please don't don't just think that we just don't want to go back. The, the concerns are serious, and and they could save a life. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry now I'm gonna not let anybody jump in and we're gonna end it now just because we gotta move on. And of course, as you know, we do have a couple other meetings coming up and other opportunities here to take, um, take input and feedback. So um, moving on, I'm gonna um, mess up the agenda again, I'm afraid folks, but it just doesn't make sense, I don't think, to go into executive session now when we still have other stuff we can sort of dispense of. So, Bob, do you mind if I turn this over to you um, for uh, the superintendent's evaluation section of our meeting? Sure. Okay, thanks. Um, we had evaluation uh, for the superintendent. Was uh, Everybody got it for the school committee. Um, there's a total of uh, 29 members between Frontier and the uh, union 38, 18 in union, 11 at Frontier. Some of us do dual roles like myself. I do Frontier, I'm chair there. I'm also on the Waitley committee and there's a few other, other ones of us that are on both. So, so I'm just gonna give you uh, on the four categories that were um, instructed to give the answers to uh, the first one was instructional leadership indicators. 58.8% were proficient, 41.2% were ex exemplary, which is the top. Uh, there was no needs improvement, no unsatisfactory, and everybody uh, gave a rating. Um, there's a bunch of um, comments. Um, I don't think we need to read all the comments on there. The next one was management and operations indicators. There again, 40, and they're split right down the middle. 47.1% was exp exposionary, and 47.1% was proficient. And there was one person I think couldn't rate it because they didn't have an answer, I would say. Standard three, family and community engagement indicator. 58.8% were proficient. 35.3% was, exp I'm having a tough time with that word. Exemplary. Thank you. Yeah. And then there was one person that says he needs improvement. <clears throat> Standard four, four, Standard four, professional culture indicator, 70.6% was proficient, 29.4% was expected. Yeah, that word. Sorry. Exemplary. Thank you, Thank you Trevor. 
welcome. And there was, and there was, everyone had some uh, comments about it, all praising um, the job that Darius has done to it for us. Um, you know, he's been with us now for over what a year, year and a half. Uh, in the and and I don't want anybody. I I wouldn't want his job. I wouldn't want our business manager's job at this point. Both jobs are really tough. I'm not saying the teachers aren't important, but these guys, they're working seven days a week, probably 18-hour days because Darius and I have talked a few times during the weekend, and that's supposed to be family time, but he's he knows that it's, it's – um, it's in, it's important to communicate, and he I think he's done a great job of communicating. Um, if any other members want to chime in and say something, Trevor, I would love to get on the bandwagon of, of praising our superintendent <laughs> publicly. Um, I just you know I know some people aren't comfortable. You know maybe Darius isn't comfortable, but I mean, shake it. He said, but I um you know I I have not done this job as long as many others um but in the f four years or so i've been on four or five years i've been on the school committee and um and then just another view of working for the town um I i'm just so blown away at at the level of communication and care he has for our for our teachers for our, for our students for the whole culture of the school um the level of communication is just um it's just great to see. It's great to work with um, everybody in town that, you know, has to do different aspects of the job to run the town is, um, you know, I, I just hear wonderful comments about how easy he is to work with and, um, and uh, how, how proficient he is at the job. And I'm just excited for the growth to come, you know, new in this position, but um, certainly has been in education for a long time. So, um, I'm, I'm excited for things to come. I think we're in a really good position. I can't think of a better leader to take us through this this horrendous pandemic and all that goes along with it. We're all learning together, and, and I'm thrilled that he's guiding us. So I just want to say thank you. All right. Thanks, Trevor. <clears throat> so it sounds like we're stuck with him, and uh, he's <laughs> – can't escape. Um, do we um i think we want to vote to approve uh superintendent's uh, evaluation so unless does anybody have any other comments it, one quick comment is there um is there a copy of that it, it maybe it got emailed out and i didn't see it yet but i, is it I have access? I'm, I'm, I'm gonna say there's it hasn't been emailed out but okay we, we can work on it we, yeah. we can work on it trevor that'd be great great thank you So I'm gonna, I guess I need a motion to uh, accept the uh, superintendent's uh, evaluation, and then I need to do a roll call vote on that. Is that something that each individual committee would do, David, or is this uh, well, are you doing as a group? I think we might as well skip the individual committee since we're uh, all. I know well, we're the ones who. That's a good question, but generally we're the ones who hire as a group along yep. the frontier committee. So I would think it would be appropriate for us to accept that evaluation as a joint com committee. Um, Does everybody vote or the voting members? Was, um, I, I would, I'm not sure if it's everybody, but if it's, do we have a quorum, do we have a quorum for every committee here? Is that what you're asking? To I'm just wondering if, you know, because some members, like I, I'm not a voting member, but um, didn't know if I still vote on, on accepting this or not, so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, just curious. If we, if we, I would, had, I would vote. I would have everybody vote. Yeah. Um, okay. We'll get clarification on that. For those watching, it's a very, we have a very confusing system that we need to compute. Yeah. We need to straighten out. It's one of the things I didn't get to this year. Someone should have dinged me on that. I got busy with other stuff. <laughs> and we do need to improve yeah. what the logistics are of that. Okay. All right. Well, I'll, I'll make a motion to accept the superintendent's evaluation. Can I get a second? Second for Trevor. Trevor McDaniel, second. All right. So I'm just going to, because we're virtually do a roll call vote starting uh, uh, with Conway. And I apologize. I'm gonna, not sure if everybody's here, so I'm just going to read all the names anyway and give a few seconds for a response. So Elaine Campbell? Yes. Michael Merritt? Yes. Philip Panter? Yes. <laughs> Uh, Ashley Dion, did she make it? 
No. Denise Storm? Denise, are you there? I think I saw you earlier. I saw she left earlier, too. So I'm going to move to Sunderland if people want to get ready to unmute themselves. So, uh, Greg Gottschalk? Aye. Gagarin or Gagarin, sorry. Yes. Jessica Corwin? Yes. Keith McFarland? Yes. Maisie Shaw? Yes. Thank you, Sunderland. Moving on to Deerfield. Uh, Ken is absent. Dave Sharp? Yes. Harry Etchells? Harry Etchells, yes. Mary Raymond? Yes. Trevor? Yes. Okay, moving on to uh, Waitley, Katie Edwards? Yes. Bob Hallen? Yes, sir. And uh, Maureen Nichols? Yes. Right. It's uh, unanimous, and we also have a very great attendance at this meeting, which is David, just a quick comment on the just kind of quickly comment. Thank you, everyone. And I just it's awkward. I you know like public praise like that. Um, but you know, I am working hard. But I do want to remind committee members that there is issues. You don't have to wait till the evaluation to let me know. And I you know I do want to correct anywhere I go astray. You know, not a perfect, it's not an easy job. To, it's not an easy job, it's not a perfect job, but I know I also misstep on places. And so um, your help along the way, because some of you have asked me to change certain things has been helpful. So when I don't get feedback, I don't know um, where I need to steer things. And so so please give, continue to give that to me. So I just want to say to the public that you guys are giving me advice in those kind of things offline as well. So it's not just a end of a year kind of thing. So thank you so much. Okay. Thanks again, Darius. Um, now I'm going to move on to some just some new business, uh, Darius. I'm going to be turning this section over to you just to let us know what's happening. Yeah, I, you know, I shared with the the committee the open letter to Frontier on um, teaching race and racism. You know, I wanted to share it with all the committees because I think you know we are a full you know, you know the front we're a greater community than just our our, our breakup of um, of schools. Um, I, it was a it was a well written letter. Um, I'm really proud of the alumni who put it together. Um, they certainly put a lot of thought into it, and I really appreciated that there was a lot of action steps that really could, um, you know, we could take action on. Um, I think the administration took it to heart, and so and it was really I thought it was really nice that the uh, seeing some of the names was was I was also wonderful for me because obviously many of you know I was either their assistant principal or principal of many of the students that were on that list, so it was good to see. I just want to share that you know our, our committee on racism and equality group um, has met, met last week, and we have excellent participation. Um, and they're starting to create an outline of actionable events for this fall. Um, we're looking at professional development. We're looking at curriculum. Um, and there's about, I would say there's probably like, you know, 25 to 30 people on this team, a good mix from the, from both um, the schools and the community. And I thought it was really a really good um, a start out of the gate. And so the next meeting is Monday. They're going to meet two more times after that, so a total of four times this summer. So um, that's kind mm -hmm. of our, our, our progress in that area. I don't have a real, they're going to send out progress notes. Um, you know, as they, I think the first meeting was really a meet and greet and just kind of get some basic thoughts and ideas out there. So I think we'll, we'll expect more from them probably after the next meeting. So I just wanted to share that because um, I think that's important in our community right now. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, I want to uh, shout out to Mariel Brown Fallon, who uh, was the one that wrote the letter for the alumni and had how many, I wasn't sure how many signatures were there. Darius, do you remember? I, I have it in front of me. It's 258 or 85. Yep. It was so I want to give a shout out to her because she, she got everybody to sign her letter. And um, I read the letter. It was on Facebook and read it. If uh, if somebody else wants to read the letter, I bet you we can probably get it in the email form or something. Can we, Darius? Yep. Okay. That'd be great. You should all have it. The committee should all have it as well. And yep. um you probably could just Google it. It's probably online yeah. as well. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Bob. Um, so at, at this point, I think um, unless anybody, any committee members have anything else to add right now in our sort of open meeting, um, we're going to move to executive uh, session to uh, discuss.
strategy with respect to collective bargaining and teachers agreement. So I, I need so to- just, like, just for clarification, I, David, so that the public knows that the committee will return to public session for a vote. Okay. So okay. we're gonna actually leave the program running. I guess that's how it works. Um, the duration of our executive session could run from 15 minutes to longer. So um, I'm just saying, I just want to be forewarned. I don't want people to think it's a five minute thing. There could be much discussion about it. So, um, but we do have to return to the open session to if if we are going to take a vote on the settlement agreement. So I'll, I'll make the motion to go to executive session, MGL chapter 30A, section 21A3 to discuss strategy, respect to collective bargaining. Okay, thanks, Bob. Second? Second. Okay, thanks, Elaine. I'm gonna roll call vote of just uh, voting members now to go into executive session. Uh, starting again with Conway, Elaine Campbell? Yes. Michael Merritt? Yes. Bill Cantor? Yes. Moving on, <laughs> moving on to Sunderland. Uh, Gary Gutduck. Yes. Peter. Yes. Eric. Jessica. Corwin. Yes. Keith McFarland. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I get sorry, Keith. Um, Ken Cadillac absent. Uh, Dave Sharp. Yes. Carrie Eccles. Carrie. Yes. Carrie. Yes. Uh, and then Waitley, uh, Katie Edwards. Uh, yes. Bob Hallam. Yes, sir. And Maureen Nichols. Yes. All right, so we're gonna go into executive session. We'll all try to find that email with the link and uh, we'll come back here when we're done. <clears throat> so after discussion with about the, the next item on agenda is the um, agreement between uh, the 38 Teachers Association. Uh, and I, I guess actually the question is, are, is each school committee supposed to vote on this individually? Yes. Because yes. Okay. So okay. what I do is I have everybody vote and then you know, I'm gonna have to double check that. Yeah. Because yeah, each one will individually, have... each one is to individually sign off on it. Yes. But I think if we all yeah. vote tonight, we can move it forward because it has to go to the union for approval still as well. If it's approved this yeah. evening, it has to go to the union for their approval. So, um, you know, that's yeah. where we're at. I'm, I'm just okay. concerned that it wasn't noticed to the individual uh, school committees that we on the contract. So what I would suggest then, um, I will make sure that we follow up this legally because this is obviously something you want to make sure it's done correctly. Um, I would vote, everybody voted. That'll give the indication that, you know, and then if I have to, I will post all four meetings before the next joint meeting yes. for us to do the one, do the votes over individually by meeting if we have to. Okay. In that time, yeah. the, the, if approved, the association will have time to approve it as well, but they know that they can move forward with business. Yeah, um, so that's a good okay. point. Yeah, that makes the most sense. Yep. Um, okay, so um, I guess, all right, well, we'll just take one motion in one second. We won't do it individually by committee then. And then if we need to later, we'll do it that way. So uh, could I get a, a motion to approve the uh, contract between the uh, school committees and the Union 38 Teachers Association? I'll make a motion. We approve the contract between the Union 38 and the school committee. Second, Jessica Corwin. Okay. okay. Thanks, Elaine. Thanks, uh, Jessica. Okay, so now um, I'm going to go through everybody's names, not just voting members, um, to get your roll call vote. And hopefully it's legal. And if not, it's certainly a sense of uh, the committee so that the union can act accordingly. So. Uh, starting with Conway, Elaine, Campbell? Yes. Uh, Michael Merritt? Yes. Philip Cantor? Yes. Ashley, yes. Yep, I got it. Ashley, do you if you've arrived? Nope. 
Uh, Denise Storm. Okay. Uh, for Sunderland, uh, Gregory Gottschalk. Yes. Peter Gagarin. Yes. Jessica Corwin. Yes. Keith McFarland. Yes. Maisie Shaw. Yes. For Deerfield, uh, Ken Cutterbeck is absent. David Sharp. Yes. Carrie Etchells. Yes. Mary Raymond. Yes. Trevor McDaniel. Yes. For Waitley, Katie Edwards. Yes. Bob Helen. Well, I don't want to be the only one that says no, because you know how I feel about this, but I will say yes to keep it in tune with everybody. But Thank you, I just, you, know, you guys know how I feel about this. Mm -hmm. Yep. Appreciate that. Uh, Maureen Nichols. Yes. Okay, it's uh, unanimous in terms of the voting members who are present. Okay, oh, Katie, thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, thanks, Dave. Any, anybody down. else? Uh, any more comments before we adjourn? I just maybe I just say one thing about you know what we just voted on. Um, that I, I may I? Yes, you may. Okay. Um, so this, you know, this, this contract I think shows um, how much this, this com these committees, this region, this district um, uh, thinks and supports our teachers. Um, we know that they're going through a hard time, as we all are, and um, this kind of financial support um, in the salary does show, you know, especially at a time like this with unknown budgets, um, you know, really shows that we, we care about them. We want them to be supported. We want them to feel supported, um, you know, secure in their contract, in their jobs for the coming two years. Um, and we appreciate that they um, are working with us to, to make sure that we have financial stability long-term so that we can continue to support you know, all kinds of different programs for the schools um, throughout the years. Um, it really, it really helps kind of balance, balance things out. And um, just, I just wanted to say we care immensely about them and we, we support them and we, uh, we hope they support this as well. Okay. Great. Thanks. Well said. I think we all agree with that. Uh, anybody else? All Make right. Make a motion to adjourn. Second that motion. Okay. Do I have to do a roll call vote on a motion to adjourn? Yes. yes. All right. Here we go. One more time, everybody. <laughs> Starting with Conway, Elaine Campbell. Yes. Michael Merritt. Yes. Bill Cantor. Yes. Uh, he's on the cape. Of course he's going to say that. He was at the adjourn hours ago. Sunderland yeah. Greg, Gregory. Yes. Uh, uh, Peter Gagarin. Gagarin. Yes. Jessica Corwin. Yes. Keith McFarland. Yes. Maisie Shaw. Yes. And for Deerfield, Dave Sharp. Yes. Carrie Etchells. Yes. Mary Raymond. Yes. Trevor McDaniel. Yes. And for Waitley, Katie Edwards? Yes. Bob Halla? Yes, sir. And Maureen Nichols? Yes. All right, everybody. Thank you all. Very much for taking the time, and we will see you either next week at various meetings or in two weeks minus a few days, next Tuesday the 28th, I think it was. Yep. All right. Yeah, thanks, thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you.